Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, brace yourselves, is Mark Ellis. You sound thrilled, and everybody <laughs> should be, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the best damn movie news show in the entire galaxy. We're so excited you guys are here. I had a phenomenal weekend in San Diego, telling jokes, eating donut ice cream sandwiches, and watching a movie <laughs> break box office expectations. We're here to talk about today. Ashley, who's joining me? Denison. Hello. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Uh, if you listened to the pre-show, you would have thought that this was going to be Bachelor talk, <laughs> a Bachelor <laughs> after show. Guys, we're talking about Josh, movies here. Fill me out here. Listen, The Bachelor is an American treasure. It's it not really a, is. an American treasure as Deadpool, but it's getting there. We're on season like seventeen. I know. All right. Half think, of us here want to talk about movies. <laughs> we're, getting getting we're, we're getting into it. We're getting into it. We're getting into it. I don't trust any. Anybody not wearing a green shirt right yeah, now. Exactly. You got me hosting it. You got Makuga on here. Dennis, your work is cut out for you today. I hope you're prepared to keep this ship aligned. Yep. Ashley, what are we talking about today first? Well, we're back after a long weekend, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Crushing even the loftiest of expectations <laughs> was number one, Deadpool, bringing in a remarkable $132.7 million. And number two was Kung Fu Panda 3, holding strong at 19 point eight million followed by how to be single at number three with 17.9 million zoolander 2 opened at number four with 13.9 million and rounding out the top five was the revenant at 6.6 6 million mark yours was slightly less wrong than most predictions <laughs> are you shocked at how well deadpool is doing yeah i'm really happy to say i was only 50 million dollars under <laughs> what deadpool actually did i thought it'd be around the 80 million dollar range i thought that was lofty apparently we do have an oracle here at collider and that would be john <laughs> Schnepp, who boldly proclaimed multiple times this movie is going to do over a hundred million dollars. After we saw the movie, we all wanted it to be that successful, but we just didn't think it's an R-rated movie. It's a lesser-known comic book hero. How is this possibly going to do it? I think it's word of mouth. I think it's a lot of different factors, but most of all, the marketing campaign. Everybody involved in the advertising of this movie should get the thirty-five million dollars <laughs> on top of the hundred that it made. You deserve it. Since this movie was announced, it was rated R. All the billboards. It's all the, the viral ad campaigns. Everything that Deadpool has done to sell his movie has been so note perfect. It's been the best campaign I've ever seen, and it paid off this weekend. So I'm very happy to see Deadpool do that well. Zoolander 2, if you talk about like a critical reaction to Deadpool maybe upping its box office, Zoolander 2, I think we saw the opposite. People just didn't really have an appetite for this movie, and you can't really blame them because as much as I love the first Zoolander, it's 15 years later, and it's really hard hard to do a sequel to a comedy in general, much less one that takes place 15 years after it's already been in and then out of the public consciousness. So those are the two that really stand out to me. It's nice to see The Revenant holding at number five. Uh, Josh, what stands out to you about this weekend? I, um, I mean, you know, I'm a huge Zoolander fan. Uh, none of the trailers really excited me too much about mm -hmm. it. And then word of mouth destroyed it. Um, the hard part, like you said, Dumb and Dumber 2, again, like 20, 20 plus years after the first one, Zoolander 15 years. The thing is, is they're no longer playing, it was a shock the first time, so they're no longer playing like acting these characters. Now they're a caricature of these characters. It's not a sequel, it's just like a revisiting of nostalgia, and we didn't need it. The movies ended so, so well we didn't need it. Now Deadpool, on the other hand, I mean, if it sniffed 100, I would have been shocked. And to get over 135... Dude, I, like you said, a marketing campaign like that, it's like the Mikey liking life cereal. Like it's <laughs> it's legendary, right? That little kid eats that cereal and all of a sudden every kid in America wants that cereal. Um, Deadpool comes out, it's like, this guy's the coolest superhero in the world. Everybody's going to be him for Halloween. I hope my little nephew starts swearing like Deadpool because he's going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, you make a great point because with Zoolander 2, you had people who were maybe doing impressions of characters, whereas with Deadpool, it felt like Ryan Reynolds was born to play this role. Dennis, yeah. did you see this thing crack in $100 million no, last not week? A, not at all. Not at all. I wrongfully <laughs> predicted $66 million and it doubled that. Uh, yeah, Schnepp, he got it on the market. I wish mm -hmm. he was here so he could take his victory lap. He's just going around and around this whole he's place. Actually, that's why he's not here. He's yeah. actually yeah. running around the studio right now. It takes him a while. Um, yeah, no no way. No way. I, I predicted 66. I would have been shocked if it was 70-something or even 80-something. But for it to be 130 something million dollars 
crazy. The one thing, though, that I've been talking with people over the you know weekend and just in general is how much is this movie of a, a game changer? Because I don't actually think it is as much as people people think like, oh, it's an R-rated superhero movie. It made a ton of money. Let's just make every movie or superhero movie or comic book movie rated R. And I think that's the wrong lesson to learn that people will learn from. I think studio execs might go, oh, yeah, well, let's just make Wolverine. He's going to be let's make him <laughs> R and have him drop F-bombs and like do stupid stuff and make sex jokes. And it's like that's not the right fit. This just happened to be the right character with the right actor with the right like at the right time you know it was just lightning in the bottle where where i don't think we can replicate this again i think it's great for deadpool but we just can't apply this to to every single movie that's right i don't think that people need to see a movie that's rated r strictly based on violence because that can get really dark and really serious and not do that well at the box office which is what a studio if they're making an r-rated comic book film now they hope to repeat the success of deadpool but you got to remember deadpool is a combination of great violence but amazing humor that is so quick with the jokes and that our rating just gave them the freedom to do whatever they wanted in either vein. Josh, going forward, do you see studios greenlighting a bunch of R-rated comic book movies simply based off this? Well, you know, the hard part is it's 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 like in The Office, right? It started that talking head kind of thing, mm. and then Parks and Rec did mm. it, then Modern Family did it, you know? And you, it's beating a dead horse a little bit. Um, I think with Deadpool, imitation is the highest form of flattery, but with the breaking of the fourth wall, you can't just do that. Yeah. That's the Deadpool thing, the Merc with the mouth, that that whole thing. I think if they were to go a little bit darker, great. But if you're just doing gratuitous violence for gratuitous violence, these these movies are going to just turn into Quentin Tarantino films. Yeah, and I don't want to turn this into a battle between men and women, but look, it was Valentine's Day. So was there a little bit of a victory <laughs> for dudes because Deadpool did so well and How to Be Single did capably. I mean, look, it was $17 million on Valentine's Day weekend for a film that was clearly marketed to be opening on Valentine's Day. Like, Deadpool could have opened any weekend out of the year how to be single needed to open this particular weekend and what was the previous record holder 50 shades of gray was the previous record holder of president's day weekend at like 93 million i don't think deadpool even thought that it was going to do that 50 shades of gray was this anomaly last year everybody freaked out they're like this can't happen they greenlit like nine sequels right after the, the first one and deadpool came in and just Put that thing into submission, pun intended. <laughs> Dennis, we're going to get into some of the other movies that are coming out uh, this weekend, a little bit later in the show, but do you see anything that's going to be able to knock Deadpool off in the next couple weeks? No, I don't think so. This is one of those things where the viral mar marketing campaign like overdid its job, where people just start talking about word of mouth, because people always say, oh, well, is word of mouth really that important? Yes, it is, because it, it brought Deadpool up, and it took Zoolander way down. Crushed people it. listen. It's, it's not just not just critics online or anything like that, but your friends. What are your friends talking about? Because if your friend is talking about Deadpool and how awesome it was, how raunchy, how violent it was, you're like, well, I never heard of this Deadpool. Maybe I should go check it out. And, and everyone talks about, goes to see it because they want to talk about it. That's right. And we here at Collider, we're your friends. Ashley, <laughs> you're my pal. What's our next story? Um, hot on the heels of Deadpool's opening weekend success is a statement from Simon Kinberg that another beloved franchise could get the big screen treatment as an R-rated movie. Speaking at a Q&A after an exclusive Collider IMAX screening of Deadpool, Kinberg dropped some hints about an X-Force flick. I think there are some stories that could be R-rated. I don't know what they are. I mean, I think the mainline X-Men movies have their own tone, which is a more operatic tone. It's more dramatic. It is more PG-13 in a way. X-Force, I could see being R-rated, and who knows? Dennis, when we get an X-Force movie, will it be rated R? Well, judging by the way that studios work, probably, I don't think it's necessary. At least... When I read uh, the X-Force comic book, there was nothing really in it that, that mm. screamed to me R rating. And But the way studios work, they want a copycat, you know? They're like, okay. And especially since this is under the same studio, like, look, look what Deadpool did. So we'll just show, Deadpool's <laughs> gonna be in there and he's gonna be the main guy. And then every, what I'm worried about is now suddenly all these characters are gonna like start having more of a Deadpool flair to him where it's just it should be just unique to his character but uh, yeah if it's R I mean that's cool but they got to show a, a good reason for it being R. Right what I think Deadpool did great is that look it, it proved to us that there doesn't have to be this hard line you draw in the sand between oh now a franchise or now a universe has a rated R movie so we can never go back yes you really can you can make some movies that are PG-13 X-Men movies are going to continue to be PG-13 Wolverine I have a hard time 
imagining this last Hugh Jackman Wolverine could possibly be rated R. But if it is, that's fine. If it's PG-13, that's fine. You can still have Deadpool play in that world with an X-Force movie. Sure, if it's rated R, that's phenomenal. I just don't think it has to be. And I think a lot of that is going to be predicated on the success of Deadpool 2. Who are we going to see in Deadpool 2? Probably more members of X-Force. I know that everybody's screaming about how Cable is definitely going to be making an appearance in Deadpool 2, maybe in a Colossus-type role. Colossus, by the way, also a member of the X-Force in the past, at least. I'm not sure if he's still there in the comic books, but he's not a rated R character. So I think you can have rated R characters in a PG-13 universe. Is X-Force like the Hydrox to Oreos of like X-Men? <laughs> like what? What is X-Force? I don't know. Like the imitation brand? I don't know much about X-Force. It's the Tastios. It's the Tastios. There's Tastios. a bunch of There's X-Men, X-Force, uh, X-Factor. <laughs> there used to be uh, New Mutants, which ended up turning into X-Force. Okay. It's just, you know, anytime you put like an X in the name, you can sell X, uh, you know, a bunch of X amount of dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I don't, um, again, like we kind of said before, is I don't necessarily think you need an R rated term. And I don't know how we would compare the X Men movies to an operatic tone. Uh, that's kind of a, a stretch there. <laughs> if you are a fan of opera, I've never seen anything X Men <laughs> related. <Yeah. laughs> Jean Grey just hitting that high note. Um, but I, I don't think that, like, okay, when you're watching Iron Man 3, they are throwing jokes at you, like forcing them down your throat, which I think kind of ruined Iron Man 2, or Iron Man 3. With Deadpool, we expected the jokes, and the jokes nailed it because he could go that R-rated route. Do you need that in all these other movies? Probably not. But if you're going to put Deadpool in those movies, you're probably going to have to go R-rated. It's a, it's a great it. point. Is, is it we, we went into Deadpool with an expectation of laughing at dirty humor and seeing really hardcore violence. If you sell X-Force, or any movie for that matter, the right way, as far as what our expectation level is going to be, how violent, how funny it's supposed to be, I think that's going to temper a lot of audiences if they end up making an X-Force film and it ends up being just PG-13. The question is, when are we going to see an X-Force movie regardless of what its rating is. It looks like, if you trust the internet, which you really shouldn't at all, it <laughs> appears that Deadpool 2 is going to be next on the slate as far as what Deadpool's doing, and then after that, maybe like you have a post-credit teaser that says an X-Force movie's coming out. Is that how you see it, Dennis? Yeah, definitely. But then I also, there, there's a fear too that, okay, I you know I like the X-Men movies, mm -hmm. and, but one of the complaints from more of the hardcore, hardcore X-Men fans is like, oh, well, we didn't really see much of Cyclops, or we didn't see these other characters. It's, it's, it's Wolverine and, and the X-Men. That's what they, mm -hmm. they consider it. Now, with X-Force, with Deadpool, there's a fear of, okay, now it's going to be Deadpool and these other guys, right. and Deadpool's going to be front and center. I mean, it, where Cable is actually a main component of X-Force. Is he going to be put to the side or is he going to be a main character? You don't want him being one of the other members of the police. Just have Sting up there <laughs> yeah. by himself. You want this to be more like a U2 situation Correct. where we know who Bono is, but we really appreciate the other dudes as yeah. well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. look, if there's one R-rated mouth on this show, it's definitely Ashley. What's our <laughs> next? It's so true. And honestly, I really think that Deadpool did so well because of the marketing. Because when, you, when you're driving and you see a huge billboard that says, like, even my mom who has no idea who Deadpool is, and you see <laughs> See, like I'm gonna smurp all over your face on a billboard like you're curious <laughs> to see what that movie is about and that's why I think it did so well so all these other movies trying to you know get this R rating it's not so necessary I feel like that's Deadpool's character he is smurping on people's faces I you would know? love to be a fly on the wall in the <laughs> middle of the kitchen <laughs> when Ashley so gets home and your mom it. asks you what does it mean to smurp on somebody's no, face no I didn't mean to use my mom as I, that's what I'm just saying my mom is like the example she has no idea who Deadpool is you know what I mean I'm gonna go but see now she knows this what smurfing on a face story. means. Yeah, story. Is this Nicholas Sparks? <laughs> they did advertise for it on The Bachelor, by the way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Bachelor movie talk. All right. One of the properties hoping to make a resurgence in the modern world of comic book blockbuster films is Spawn. And according to writer Todd McFarlane, fans may finally get the movie version they've always wanted. McFarlane offered an update while at Toy Fair 2016, stating that he's finished the script and the movie would be rated R. I'd put it more into the horror suspense supernatural genre. If you take the movie The Departed meets Paranormal Activity, something like that. In the background, there's this thing moving around, this boogeyman. That boogeyman just happens to be something that you and I intellectually know as Spawn. Will he look like he did in the first movie? No. Will he have a supervillain he fights? No. He's going to be the Spectre, the Ghost. Josh, are you excited for Spawn's chance at cinematic redemption? Okay, first of all, that is the most confusing description <laughs> of a movie ever. The Departed meets Paranormal Activity? What? 
Okay, I love Spawn. <laughs> uh, Spawn was one of the first comic books I ever bought. I ever started collecting. Me and my brother loved Spawn. Uh, the John Leguizamo movie was quite a disappointment. Um, but the description of this movie is... I don't understand like what we're getting at here. Like the ghosts in the background, just right... Like Spawn, if you want, if you read like the first thirty or forty issues of Spawn, Spawn is like what the John Leguizamo movie is. Or is they just didn't pull it off that well. If they were to come in with like modern day kind of look at it, a little bit darker, already kind of stuff, I think they could do that. I don't think they have to go Ghost Specter route, which is a lot of like the later issues. And Todd McFarlane has been such a great ambassador for his beloved baby Spawn over the years. And I think sometimes if you created a property and you so adore it, and it came out to the public in movie movie form and it just did not do well at all it wasn't received well people had a huge backlash against it and you've taken so much time and you've tried to get it back off the ground in various formats which have worked in the past comics the animated whatever you see of spawn usually it's pretty awesome but sometimes you can get so inundated with what you're writing get into your own head as far as trying to change the perception from the previous movie it can get a little muddled so i love that todd mcfarlane has a completed script i'm very interested to see how his studio is going to react to that whether it's rated rpg 13 i think for most fans is second secondary to what the actual story is. I don't think you can get too caught up in trying to be so different from the movie that came out in the 90s that was horrible. You can still take elements of that and make a really good film and be loyal to the war that is Spawn. Dennis, how do you see this? Well, I'm a huge Todd McFarlane fan. I Yeah, I collected Spawn as Did well. Yeah, first yeah. 30, 40 issues. Mm -hmm. And definitely what he's describing is not the Spawn that I know. Maybe, maybe now it's issue 200 and whatever, 56, right. that that's what he is but back then he was yeah more kind of like an anti-hero you know the way he also in this comment he says he's not gonna look the same i'm like yeah. part of spawn's appeal is the look yeah he the looks chains, badass. yeah he's yeah. awesome he the, sold the multi-million dollars worth of toys because yeah. of that look and he had a big bad there is a big bad yeah. in those comics the devil yeah it, yeah and so wait you're gonna have a superhero movie without a big bad you're just gonna have a ghost hanging around in the background and it's meeting the departed what is it leonardo dicaprio with a boston <laughs> accent being like oogity boogity bruh <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'm so confused <laughs> by this. I don't understand it. I love Spawn. I want to see a good Spawn movie. I think we all do. Uh, th this whole thing is just confusing. Yeah, the know. animated series on HBO was pretty good and very Great. faithful to for, to the comic book. Yeah. And in and, and like we were talking about, even though the movie wasn't that great, it was kind of more faithful and it, it, it tried to accomplish what the comic book was about but it had problems because the I mean the budget was very low yeah. for that movie and you could see it on the screen but now with today if you put a decent budget in there and with the visual effects of today imagine how cool his cape is going to look uh, I know. today yeah. I, I think that if you're an exec and you look at something like the spawn property and and you want to you want to have Deadpool as your template you can do that in an R-rated fashion but you also have to look at what Deadpool was that was a very unique and singular telling of an origin story in a world where we're so inundated with so many different origin stories and we're tired of seeing how a superhero developed. When now we just want to see them team up with other superheroes and fight crime. It's cool to see somebody become a superhero if you do it in a unique way. And there's no more unique way to become a superhero or an anti-hero in Spawn's case than what happened to this Marine who ended up going to hell, paying for his sins, coming back in this entirely different world than he thought he was getting into. So it seems like something that would be a no-brainer if you did it right. But it, do you guys think that maybe Todd McFarlane needs some help? He, he where, where the fear you don't want to become a, a George Lucas where he has so total control over his empire that maybe it, it, you suffer on the creativity. It's, it, it's definitely possible because he originally, he sold his rights to New Line Cinema for $1 for the, mm -hmm. so that he could have more creative control over the movie and that, I mean, obviously he got merchandising rights as well. So yeah, it's, it's definitely possible. And, and you know, McFarlane, he, I mean, he's still around the game, but remember he's been collecting baseballs and making <laughs> figures and stuff like that. He hasn't exactly been 100% yeah. focused on comic books. Hey, Robbie, why Spawn got a Red Sox jersey <laughs> on? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you've seen a Paranormal Activity movie, you know Toby the Demon was working with Nicholson <laughs> yeah. in some capacity. Come on. That's all I'm going to say. Come on, Mac. He's well, now guy. we are on to that portion of the show called Buy or Sell. It's very simple. Ashley's going to present us with a topic, and then we're going to schmep as to whether we say yes <laughs> or no, buying or selling. <laughs> Ashley, <laughs> what's up first? I combine schmerf and, right? and schnep. <laughs> schnep is probably schmerfing right now. He's so happy about that Deadpool take. Oh. 
my gosh. Well, a new trailer for the Jeff Nichols film Midnight Special dropped this weekend. After a father learns his child possesses special powers, they must go on the run to avoid being captured. The movie stars Michael Shannon, Joel Edgerton, Kirsten Dunst, and Adam Driver. Mark, buy sell this new trailer for Midnight Special. Huge buy for me, baby. This is what I wanted E.T. to be. We got something <laughs> special. We got the government after. Let's have an action movie. Well, if you give me Jeff Nichols and you deal me Michael Shannon, his go-to boy when he makes a film, I'm already on board. I don't care what it is, if it's mud, if it's acquired or drama, and then you give me this kind of premise. Holy crap. Is this an X-Man? Is, is Professor X after him? What's happening? Who's chasing him? Why do they want the special powers so bad? Another actor in this film that always lends credibility to a film is Sam Shepard. Watching him and Adam Driver in this trailer go back and forth. This is Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren <laughs> is looking for a kid with special powers. Yep. What more do I need to sell you on this movie? The trailer did a phenomenal job of showing us a lot of what the story is going to be, but not giving away too much. Michael Shannon, as a dad in this film, trying to protect his kid, it seems like a different, maybe stepping out of his comfort zone, which is creepiness. So I'm very excited to see one of my favorite actors, a director who's a huge up-and-comer, have a chance to knock this thing out of the park. Oh, I'm definitely buying this. I actually missed the first trailer. I think I was on vacation when it came out. So when this came out, I was like, oh, this is the second trailer. So mm -hmm. I watched them both. I love it. It's kind of like a mix between like a Sixth Sense and E.T. Like there's a very Spielberg vibe to this with the boy. Yeah. Great cast. Uh, Joel Edgerton's in it, who's now becoming one of my favorite actors. I just saw him in, in Jane Got a Gun, which was it was a decent movie. It wasn't terrible or anything, but he, his acting performance in that and he was in Black Mass. And then that, that, that movie that surprised me the most last year was The gift just any edition of him michael shannon and jeff nichols did uh mud which was my favorite year of or favorite movie of 2012 mm -hmm. so i'm all for it josh you were a boy with special powers I at know. one point how does this trailer hit you uh man i'm so buying this i mm -hmm. really i watched this thing three times in a row because i wanted to it, it, it combines that weird like cultish religion kind of thing because they found this boy that you can pick that up from the trailer and like you said anything michael shannon you see michael shannon on screen you know nothing good is coming like that guy <laughs> has never been like oh Michael Shannon's here. Let up the, let's get crazy. He's the party animal. No, Michael Shannon, you're coming. There's guns falling you. Something bad's gonna happen. And that kid uh, who who plays uh, what's his name in the trailer? Like Alton something. Anyway, the kid with special powers. The kid with special powers was awesome in Saint Vincent. He was so good. In right. that movie. If you don't if you don't cry at the end of Saint Vincent, there's something wrong with you. Um, he it this just looks like something that you would have hoped that Neil Blomkamp would have followed up District 9 with. Like, this is something that I think he he's watching being like, God, I should have thought of something like this. Because his movies have kind of been disappointing, but you, you could see a cool little effect, like something like a Neil Blomkamp, like you said. Or uh, what was that, that movie with uh, Elle Fanning? Um, Super 8? Super 8. Mm -hmm has like a super eight kind of feel yeah. to it small town uh you know like the army coming after this movie just looks i mean buy early pay later it's always awesome. nice to see a movie come out where it looks like it might have a superhero element to it but it's so not being sold as a superhero film now it might not transfer into dollars at the box office but the movie comes out in march i think it's a nice landing area where it's not necessarily going to have oscar consideration pressure on it it's not going to have summer blockbuster it, it, you know you don't need to make a hundred million dollars opening weekend this could be a movie that comes out gets a lot of critical praise and keeps doing well week after week after week. I hope people are talking about it. Well, just this. make it rated R. Have him hack and slash everyone <laughs> and just spit dirty jokes out. And it's going to be over 100, right? 100 million? That's the formula now? We just made a great movie, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Ashley, welcome. what do we got next? Speaking of new trailers, fans saw more of 10 Cloverfield Lane over the weekend. A new trailer gives us more background into the story and appears to tie these events in more so with the original 2008 film. The new movie stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead and John Goodman. Dennis Byers saw the latest trailer for 10 Cloverfield Lane. I buy this. It still has a sense of mystery to it. I love how they're, they're doing this where they kept it a secret and now the movie's just right around the corner. Because imagine if this had come out maybe a year ago and it's like you're waiting and waiting eventually you're just going to forget about it right but this is still in our mind about how new and secret this was i like this trailer because it has a little contrast with with uh, mary elizabeth weinstead's character and her she's kind of ab abducted in there and she doesn't know if, if if john goodman's character is telling the truth and if he's actually protecting her or not and then you have the other character i forgot the actor's name but he was a uh, jim in newsroom and he and she's like oh how right. did your um how did you break your arm? He's like, oh, I was trying to break in here because he wanted to live. So that kind of gives credence to John Goodman's uh, story. So it's kind of like I like that mystery of is he telling the truth or not? And 
then we get to see is this really connected to Cloverfield? The you, movie? You, you you make a great point because unlike uh, a lot of movies where they have to let you know they're coming out a year, two years in advance, this is a movie that just snuck up on us. And that first trailer, when you see this threesome living together in this house, and it feels like they're all of a singular mind. They all have the same goal, which is to survive whatever's coming. And now this trailer, it's like no, 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 no. There's conflict involved. We are not here necessarily against our will, but we're also not here because we want to be here. There's something going on outside we have a very uh, you know separate views on what it is or what the threat level is john goodman when he says that line of mary elizabeth winston trying to protect oh my god this thing it seems like we should be knowing more about whether this ties into cloverfield the original one but i don't know if it does and i still don't really care it seems like a great small twilight zoney kind of movie and that's what i want to see I, I, I'm buying this. I loved the first Cloverfield. It's not, again, it snuck up kind of out of nowhere. Like, oh, this mm -hmm. is kind of cool found footage kind of thing. Um, this movie is basically you take room, which is so sad and creepy in that tiny little thing, but then you make it into that cool little bunker, right? Everybody wants that bunker. How that bunker looks, <laughs> looks pretty awesome. But you have no idea what's going on outside. Do you go look? You see like the help thing scratching the window. So the, the mystery behind this trailer it's got me hooked. I'm in. And I want to see what's out there. Yeah, I don't, I'm like you. I don't hate the idea of just living in a bunker for a while either. Like, like when I saw, I think it was season two. Remember, remember the there was a season cliffhanger of Lost, mm. right? Which J.J. Abrams, by the way. Yeah. And there's a hatch. Yeah. And yeah. then and then one of the episodes, you just see what's been going on in the hatch or what used to go on in the hatch. This just dude wakes up, puts on some nice Carpenter's records, whatever he does, <laughs> makes himself some breakfast, goes for a run, and that's his day. It's very simple because there's the outside world, and God help us if we ever discover what is going on up there. Right. So this seems like a movie that's really going to take the world by storm. We hope so because we're buying it. <laughs> Uh, okay, kids, it is time for opening this week. There's a lot of great movies playing at AMC theaters, and we like to give you guys a little synopsis as to exactly what's going down this weekend. So, Ashley, what's the movie that we're going to be paying to see? Opening this weekend is Race, which follows the true story of one of the most inspirational athletes of all time. Jesse Owens, played by Stefan James, quests to become the greatest track and field competitor in history while thrust him onto the world stage at the 1936 Olympics, where he faces off against Adolf Hitler's vision of Aryan supremacy. The movie also stars Jason Sudeikis, Jeremy Irons, and William Hurt. Josh, are you excited to check out Race? I uh, I read a biography about Jesse Owens. It, it, this whole story has always intrigued me. Um, something about obviously in our, in our world, uh, World War II strikes the imagination. So anything about World War II. Uh, we want to see whether it's like Schindler's List, but this is a really inspirational story. And the story of Jesse Owens is is something else. He's uh, out of Ohio State. Uh, he breaks world records as a college student. And then, you know, Hitler didn't want the Olympics in, in Germany, but Goebbels convinced him that this was going to be the coming out party for the Aryan nation. And then Jesse Owens goes in and just destroys everything and is actually helped by a German uh, in in the Olympics. It's a really, really unbelievable story. I don't know if it'll do that well in the box office. These real life, true life sports stories like haven't been doing well lately. Um, I do want to see it because I, I love the story, but I just don't think it's going to do that well. I mean, I think that this movie looks like something like, like Million Dollar Arm, which was Disney, or even the Jackie Robinson movie 42, where I think that if, for whatever their production budget was and they came out, they did they did fine at the box office for you know not having a huge, uh, it's not a summer tent pole kind of movie. But the story of Jesse Owens, I hope people go see this movie if it's good, because Jesse Owens is a guy, like, look, three of my favorite athletes that I will tell you right off the bat of all time, you got Jackie Robinson, Doug Williams, and Bo Jackson, okay? This guy is like a combination of all of those things, yeah. and he's the reason why all these other athletes that we love today were able to thrive in their sports because of what Jesse Owens accomplished at the 1936 Olympics. It's a story that needs to be told. I'm excited to see not only Stefan James as Jesse Owens, but Jason Sudeikis in a different kind of role than we've seen him before. That's a nice little nugget as well. And, you know, you go see this movie, Dennis, and it's a story that maybe not a lot of people have heard of. They were aware of what was going on in 1936 in the world. World, seeing Hitler try to set up this stage, try to slant it so he can announce his dominance over the world and to have some guy come in and completely piss on that party yeah. is just one of the coolest <laughs> stories that you guys need to check out. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in seeing this. And, and 42 was a movie that I enjoyed and liked, but I didn't love it. And, and I think when you're talking about these sports movies, I think a lot of them have just become paint by numbers. You know, they're yeah. like, OK, we're going to say this, this, this side of this character and then he's going to do this and that. And, and then eventually we all know where it's going. I think hopefully this movie does something different, does something 
something more than just that. And uh, yeah, and St- uh, Stefan James, is that his name? Mm-hmm. He was in Selma. He played John Lewis in Selma. And so right. I- I'm really looking forward to him kind of anchoring a movie. That's right. And if you guys have ever checked out Bill Burr's stand-up, he does an amazing bit on what it was like to be hanging out with Hitler at the 1936 Olympics <laughs> watching Jesse Owens ruin his parade. It's hysterical. Make sure you guys check it out. Uh, so now we're on to the segment of the show called Mailbag. If you guys want to get your question read on the air by our own talented Ashley Mova, make sure you guys email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. And we want to remind you guys, at the end of this show, we're going to save some time to do live Twitter questions. How do you get a question on air? You tweet us right now at Collider Video. Ashley is the gatekeeper, so make sure you guys mention her hair and how nice it looks today because she did get it recently groomed. Ashley, what's first on the mailbag? Christopher Garrity writes, I'm a big fan of the show. Watch every day. Question, did you guys see the Star Wars Episode Eight production official teaser they put out? If so, what did you think of the Skellig Michael Island reshoot? Keep bringing the filthy. Oh, was there was there Star Wars news? This, what? <laughs> was this, this, this You're goddamn right I saw this thing. I lost my mind and I know that people are going to be like it's nothing it's literally nothing and you're not necessarily wrong for saying that it's just awesome that this was an official Star Wars thing they said episode 8 production is underway and it's just further proof that guys we live in a world now (laughs) where there's going to be very very tiny pockets of life where you do not get some sort of Star Wars movie news or trailer or something exciting so enjoy those pockets if you don't like Star Wars and if you do love Star Wars like I think we all do Enjoy this stuff, man. It is so awesome. Just to see that that, that sweeping shot of Skelly Michael Island, you get to see Luke Skywalker, they hang on him, then you see Ryan Johnson yell, cut. And it's just nice to see proof that this movie's actually underway. I'm not sure why it was done. I'm not sure why it was released to the public. I'm not sure if it was something that Disney said, hey, you know what? We pushed the release date back six months to December 2017, so maybe we just need to let the kiddies know we're still on track, we're still making a movie, everybody's still friends. What struck me most about this little promo was Ryan Johnson makes a lot of dark stuff. There's, you know, he did Looper and Breaking Bad episodes. He seems like a, a smaller, quieter guy. When he said cut, that was beautiful. I was like, ah, oh, I want to have a beer with this guy. <laughs> he seems like a really fun fellow. Dennis, you saw this thing this weekend. Did you lose your mind? I'm going to have to be Jedi Council John Campia and be, <laughs> eh, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I'm super excited that episode eight has started filming. Right. But this, right. I, like, everyone was going bat shit crazy over this thing over the internet this weekend and I'm clicking on it and I'm like watching it and I'm like that's it? <laughs> like <laughs> like what, we didn't see anything and oh. like he's talking about a reshoot I don't think that was a reshoot I think that was just behind the scenes footage from episode 7 when they shot that scene and they just plucked it in there right you can tell it's not they didn't shoot that uh, on film that was like some video camera and then you know they just cut to 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 ryan johnson which probably he wasn't even shooting that scene it was like some totally different scene and they're like oh episode eight's coming like okay great Here okay comes dennis coming in hot like <laughs> there's some guy on a flip phone just <laughs> taping luke skywalker his glorious beard See, okay. flapping in the wind i'm gonna, I'm gonna play Michael. the role of christian on jedi council for <laughs> a second it's the best thing ever because <laughs> what i will tell you is that i watched thing, the one thing and, and i'm probably reading way too many tea leaves about this but look what do you you see that shot of Luke Skywalker and I know it might be like a different alternate take from at the end of episode 7 but wh- who did we not see who's the one guy that we did not see in any of the episode 7 promo material it was Luke Skywalker they were saving him for the end they didn't you know the big reveal or whatever so episode 8 comes out and the first promo that we've seen that's official of this movie is a long hanging shot on Luke Skywalker he's going to be more than just a background trainer in here mm-hmm. he's going to be one of the front center pieces that they're going to be using to sell this movie and I think that's the right play agreed uh, I I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay, it was only 30 seconds. You got eight solid seconds of a close-up of Luke Skywalker profile, which, I mean, come on. Star Wars boner. Watch that all day. And then then you just see like 50 people behind the camera. They're all like, yeah, I'm so good. (laughs) Crafty's back there like, come on. I, so I mean I'm again somewhere in the middle. It it just I got, I get chills when I watch it for the first time because I'm just like holy crap. Episode eight has started. It we're. Star Wars, like you said, it's just continuous now. It's a beautiful, just like motion of of Ro- uh, Rogue One, then Episode Eight. Ah, oh, so exciting! Don't get me wrong. I, it's not that I don't get moved by these behind the scenes things. That remember that uh, kind of like two or three minute uh, video behind the scenes video that Star Wars played at at Comic Con last right. year. Like that gave me the chills. You had J.J. Abrams. This is the first day of a new Star Wars movie. Blah blah, and they showed all this stuff. This was not that. Yeah, that true. Was, that, that yeah. looked very very. 
short. Yeah, and, and I know. Look, there, there's a difference between like us getting excited because of what we come from and how how much we've all loved Star Wars, and then that is very different than getting excited about what this news means. I mean, it's yeah. not really news, but I do have some news for you guys. If you're fans of Collider Jedi Council, man, can you guys make an impact? today there's a thing called the star wars podcast awards and we want you guys to consider us to be one of those that are nominated for the best podcast and a bunch of other categories in the tier well 2015 would be the year you're voting for collider jedi council you can go to star wars podcast awards.com right now and you could submit us to be one of those that are nominated in contention to win awards so if you guys wouldn't mind today is the last day you can do it so you can vote today you can nominate us today go to star wars podcast awards dot com and vote for your friends over at Collider Jedi Council, which, by the way, I haven't been there in like five weeks, but <laughs> <laughs> still on the show. Yeah. Maybe not this week, but very, very soon. <laughs> All right. Frank the Tank, right? Favorite movie quotes. One of mine is Lone Star. I'm your father's brother's nephew's cousin, former roommate. What does that make us? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Look, Spaceballs is a quotable film from start to finish. I'm going to I'm gonna kick off with a couple of the easy ones. These were my two senior quotes as I was graduating high school, and I think they've served me well in my life. One was, do or do not, there is no try from Yoda, right? The other one was, I'm making this up as I go along from Indiana Jones. Now, I have some more obscure ones that I'm going to save. I'm going to let you boys go ahead. Who wants it? Josh? Dennis, go. Oh, I mean, aside from anything from Clue, which I think is very <laughs> clo- quotable, um, one of my favorite movies, Lawrence of Arabia, the scene where he, uh, Lawrence comes out Deep of cut, the, 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 the Nafu Desert when he goes back to save uh, Gassim, and he comes out of the desert. First of all, they said it was impossible to even cross the desert. He goes back in there to save the guy he comes out everyone's like totally shocked and surprised they run out after him and like they're cheering they come up to him and um, and Omar Sharif's character uh, Sharif Ali goes up to him and gives him the water and like Lawrence uh, drinks it and he just says nothing is written and then it's like you know he just kind of drops the mic right there it's one of my favorite yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Josh beat it well (laughs) Uh, obviously, Bad Boys 2, shit just got real. Yes, uh, that's a classic. I mean, come on. Uh, Dumb and Dumber, I don't know, Lloyd, the French are assholes. Uh, I mean, I, I can, my my family calls me that I have EMQ, excessive movie quoting disorder, right? <laughs> Where I just quote movies all the time. That's what I do. Um, and so there, everything from comedies gets me really excited, but you know, things from Goodfellas, like, what am I, a clown? I amuse you? This guy wants me to baptize his kid for five grand. But, you know, like, that's kind of, that's all we had, Karen. Like, that kind of <laughs> stuff gets me excited. But, I mean, honestly, he brings up space balls. We've been combing the desert for hours. We ain't found shit. Oh, like, that dude, yeah. That might best. be the best line in space balls. And when I referred to Josh McCougar having special powers as a boy earlier, it was just his EMQ ability. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a, so Frank the Tank is the one that wrote this in. Yeah, so yeah. my favorite line from old school that I quote a lot out of context is, ah, pretty nice little Saturday. Yeah. We're going to try to go to home team. I don't know if we'll have time. Yeah. I, I love that. I love, there's some that just inform your sense of humor when you're growing up. So one of those just random ones was from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's dead dishes are done man. <laughs> i like that whenever i get off the phone with somebody and whether i wanted to talk to them or not i always think to myself frank cross in scrooge when he says if only i could fire that poor bastard <laughs> i just say it and then my favorite one my favorite one of all time young guns 2 Billy the Kid, Emilio Estevez, when he looks at a dude, he knows he's got this badass reputation now. This guy's about to go for his gun, and he says, Yoo-hoo, I'll make you famous. Oh, my God, uh, what a <laughs> mic drop moment that was. And that it was also in a desert, Dennis. So, uh, look, movie quotes. Ashley, do you have a movie quote that just sticks in your mind as like, this is um, this, this is everything that encompasses MOVA? Basically everything Mean Girls, obviously, a given. Yeah. But <laughs> one I use on the on a daily basis is when someone's trying to act cool from Bridesmaids, when Kristen Wiig is on the plane in her drunk scene, she's like, you do. <laughs> oh, I went to the Deadpool screening. Oh, you do. <laughs> Another Love Western it. is uh, Unforgiven. At the Ooh. very end, when he uh, when Clint Eastwood's got Gene Hackman down, he's like, I don't deserve this. And he's like, deserve there's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> and, di- and it's from the same movie, Dying Ain't Much of a Living Kid. <laughs> Dude, the chat board is going crazy with different quotes right yeah. now. One of the ones that they mentioned that we should also say is uh, Roddy Piper and They Live. I'm here to kick ass and chew bubblegum, yeah. <laughs> and I'm all out of bubblegum. How about well, you said a Christmas movie when uh, this is one of the most underrated quotes in uh, Christmas Vacation when he goes, It's good. 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 
<laughs> and anything from The Godfather yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's just movies like Caddyshack and Fletch you just can quote nonstop. And we could be here all oh, day. Mrs. But Havisham. we do need to get to your live Twitter questions, as Daddy promised you. So, Ashley, you got a few lined up. What are the kids talking about this morning? Well... Andy writes, with Deadpool's massive success, do you think Suicide Squad could get rated R? Suicide Squad has not been rated yet, right? Correct? I don't They're believe Suicide Squad has been rated. And I think that one of the things that is going to determine the rating for Suicide Squad, you might not be able to go back and change anything. And I don't think you necessarily want to, to say, oh, you know what? The R-rated movie did well. Let's go put some more blood and guts in there. Yeah. Like, I don't want that to happen, but... There's, there's been whispers, and I think they talked about a movie talk last week, that maybe Batman v Superman isn't the amazing Oscar-winning picture that all of us fans <laughs> hope it is. But if it comes out and it's met with less than critical love and the movie doesn't do as well as the studio wants it to be, there might be a campaign from David A or whoever else at the studio to say, hey, Suicide Squad is a movie. Now we might want to separate ourselves from everything else going on in the DC universe. I think that's a worst case scenario, but Suicide Squad, what well, we've already seen from the trailers, that tone is very different than what we've seen from DC movies up to this point. Suicide Squad looks like it's gonna have a lot more fun. There's gonna be some more levity to it and also some gritty action in there as well. So it's gonna be interesting to see after Batman v Superman comes out, what the ad campaign for Suicide Squad looks like. Dennis, what's your take? I think it's gonna remain PG-13. I think if they wanted to make it R, they should have made that decision just like with Deadpool a long time when they they started shooting I mean what are they going to do just add like little like blood splatters and then like well, a, the and, then, and then ADR <laughs> in like a bunch of like F-bombs like you know people off screen so yeah. I, I think that's not the way to go but I think like we were talking about before Suicide Squad could hit that nice little sweet spot between like the edge of PG-13 and the edge of rated R like right at that thing because you know Harley Quinn's got that baseball bat she's always swinging around and the Joker's gonna electrocute people with his silver teeth I mean there's there's parts of this movie that are gonna be really really dark and I'm, I'm looking forward to see how far they can push it with the PG-13 rating yeah me too and I'm just I've never been one of these people that's like uh, that, that needs the rating to get me to see a movie even yeah. if it is a something that, that promises a lot of action, a lot of raunchy laughs. I don't know that you need an R rating. Sometimes some limitations on artistic ability are a good thing because it makes you think outside the box. If you want to do this scene where some guy's head explodes and you want to have blood splatter all over the camera and the studio's like, well, that, that's going to get us an NC-17. We yeah, can't yeah. do that. So think of a more creative way to pull off the same scene you wanted to do. I see nothing wrong with that. And so I think Suicide Squad, Dennis, I agree with you. Whatever they went into that production, hoping to make and the rating they were hoping to get, that's what they should stick with, regardless of how well Deadpool did or whatever Batman v Superman does. All right, Matthew Rivers writes, who's your favorite musician turned actor slash actress? Uh, John Bon Jovi's in Young Guns too. That's um, true. Favorite musician, you know, somebody who passed away uh, a few weeks ago was David Bowie, who made a great sure. transition into on-screen presences, and he was never the biggest actor in the world because he didn't want to be. He took roles that fit him and it's great i mean look obviously labyrinth was amazing mm -hmm. too but uh he had so many iconic roles just being a different version of david bowie and he always lent something very special to the production so that's the first one that sticks in my mind bowie's a great one what about marky mark yes. and the funky bunch Whoa. everyone forgets that he was actually a rapper before yeah. that's right that's yeah. right good vibrations that was, that was the name of the song yeah come on come yeah. on and he's turned out to be a pretty good good actor yeah he's damn good yeah uh, obviously Bowie has a special place in my heart my great pull with Marky Mark didn't even think about that uh, I kind of underrated like Tim McGraw every time he's in a movie he's like a bit character like a dad or like the sort of love interest or something like he's great in the blind side um, I think uh, the obvious one that we want to go with is Timberlake because it seems like that guy can do anything but his movies aren't really good per se like, he's funny on SNL but his movies haven't been really that good yeah I think they, they tried to make him like an action star in that yeah. like out of time movie in time, was, yeah. In, in time, in time. yeah and it was just not good at all did he say actor? What about like actress? Actress, he said singer? Actress too. I'm thinking. Yeah. Whoever was in, I, I can't remember the entire cast of, uh, of Dream Girls, but uh, I think Jennifer, was Hudson. Jennifer Hudson, Hudson was in, and she was she was in American I don't think she won American Idol, right? No, was she was like fourth place yeah, or something like that. And she's proven she has chops. Macy Gray, somebody else who, like, when she pops Barbara up on Streisand? Screen, yes. 
Babs. Babs. Sure. Christ. There you go. Yeah, yeah those are some good ones. Yeah. John Bon Jovi was in Young Guns too. How do you That's guys you need feel about Lady Gaga's acting? One. That's right. His head oh, blew up. Lady Gaga in uh, Lady American Gaga Horror Story. Lady Gaga acting. How do you feel about I her acting? I haven't watched uh, American Horse, the her season of that, but she won a Golden Globe yeah. for it, right? So yeah, but I think it's probably general. better than Ronda Rousey acting. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> this is true. All right. Aaron writes, what do you think of Jared Leto's Jared Leto's method acting giving a rat and dead pigs his presence makes him a better actor uh, you know my girlfriend's dog molly gives me a rat every day <laughs> and i don't really thank her for it i know ashley's gonna have a very strong opinion on anything jared leto does including what he might bring to you for valentine's day Ooh. um mm. I, I i like method acting to me is something when you take it to that level it seems ridiculous to me i laugh at it i think it's stupid i don't think you need to do it to get into character i think yeah. jared leto would have been just the same joker that we're gonna get to see if he didn't do all that other crazy stuff but it's hilarious to talk about same thing with double d lewis when he's on set at as Abraham Lincoln, and he never breaks character. I think it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. But look, the results speak for themselves, right? Yeah, well, like Daniel Day-Lewis, they always talked about on Gangs of New York, would sit during Crafty and just have a big knife and look at people while he was cutting meat at Crafty. <laughs> Guy's insane. It's, I think they, a lot of these method actors do this simply for the stories that are told offset. Where uh, my buddy of mine worked on Suicide Squad and he said that Jared Leto wouldn't go out with people. That like he'd leave set and be like, I'll see you tomorrow, <laughs> or will I? You know, like it's just freaking creepy, man. I uh, he's so hot. <laughs> oh, oh, cool. He's so hot. <laughs> yeah, I, for me, it's like, I. You know, I don't. I can't question their process because the results speak for themselves. Exactly. You see Abraham Lincoln, and from what we've seen from the Joker, and I think, yeah, you know, like people Spires who, Club. yeah, people who have gone through, uh, you know, use method acting. It's not the only technique, but the people use different techniques to get through their process. But if that's the one they're mo most comfortable with, I'm fine with it. Yeah. yeah, but like those are the ones you hear about yeah. because they won o Oscars. You yeah. know, it's like you never hear. I don't know if everybody tries the method act and it doesn't always work out. Like I don't know, like, like Polly Shore, he's like uh, trying to. <laughs> Method act. Yeah, actually, Polly Shore is that me. the entire time. Yeah. But like, 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 like his act right now, the way he is, is is that's actually an act. That's yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> and that happens to a lot of comedians where they just fall into what they are on stage, and that's just who they are. So I'm not sure if there's been like I'd love to see that online, like the the worst you know method acting performances in history. But there's a yeah. great story from Marathon Man, who with Dustin Hoffman was a young up and coming actor, and I think was it Lawrence Olivier? I, I want to say was in that too. There was a there was a very famous well trained older actor and uh, to get in to get ready for a scene D dustin hoffman ran like 10 miles or something he's like out of breath he's like ready to shoot the scene and then the older actor comes up to him, he's like what are you doing he's like oh i had to you know had to get into into character and then he's like hey, how, how do you do it and the guy looks at him he's like acting <laughs> that's how i do it yeah exactly what's next ash joseph meldrum writes do you think short films could become more of a thing i wouldn't mind going to the theater to pay a couple bucks for a quickie <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't want to Great see there, your short film, but uh, I think short films can definitely come into further prominence. And it's not necessarily because people are going to go to a movie theater to pay to see them, but it's because you can go online and you can see people's shorts. I've seen shorts, and a lot of times directors like to make shorts, and it kind of sells them on a studio or vice versa, where somebody can look at a short film you made and really get excited about you making a feature league film. But shorts on their own can be a work of art as the Oscars shows us every year. There's shorts that everybody needs to see and being able to watch content online helps those out more so than feature films. So yeah, I think shorts have nowhere to go but up. Yeah, I'm with you. It's got to be online, the future of shorts. You're not going to get someone to, not even just the money, the trouble to make it to the theater to watch a 20 minute thing, you know? So I, I feel like online's the way to go and, and, and it is a good showcase for filmmakers. But what could be cool, like uh, what, what they'll do at Sundance or film festivals is they'll show six or yeah. eight shorts in a row. Well, that would be kind of cool if like some of these independent theaters were like a night of shorts in certain theaters and you could go and watch these shorts and, and people could, you know, like what was the movie? Um, Wes Anderson had a uh, the Hotel Le Cavalier, I think it was called. It was before a movie, like he showed a short before, maybe it was Darjeeling Limited. Uh, I forget, but um, he had a short before it that got nominated for stuff. It was Natalie Portman and, and Jason Schwartzman. Um, but I think there, that it would be really cool if before, instead of uh, all these trailers, like they showed the trailer and then maybe like a 10 minute short before some of these feature length films would be a really cool way to feature up and coming filmmakers. Yeah, I, uh, like what Pixar does with uh, with their little shorts. Yeah. I, I just love the idea of a short film festival and they happen all over the place and it's great because it's like a day, you know, it's a festival, <laughs> but it's like a day. Like when you go to Sundance to see a feature film festival, your hotel bill is like 
hundred dollars, and that's if you're staying at Super Eight. Yeah. Like they leave the light on for you. I'm telling you, man, yeah. you just want to go one day, knock all your shorts out. Yeah. The X Files writes, "Do you think there will be a San Andreas two, or do you think it's more of a one and done thing?" I kind of see a for some reason, and you're kind of going to get San Andreas too with the same actor and the same director when they collaborate again for the upcoming Rampage film, yeah. <laughs> which we all just are losing our mind over. Yeah. I can't wait to see that for his trailer. Ram, uh, San Andreas too. How do you up the stakes? Yeah. Like you pretty much crumbled the United States of America. They went so big with that. They're like, it's not just enough to have an earthquake in California and wreck everything. That thing was sending shockwaves around the globe twice. So what's the? How do you up the ante in San Andreas too? I think they're gonna make one, but they made a mistake because they call it San Andreas, so it's it's limited to that area. And, Great point. And yeah, then yeah. they're like, okay, well, it affects the rest of the world. It's like that was my biggest complaint about that movie. Is I, I never felt like it was like a global thing or even a like a domestic thing. It just seemed limited to that the, small area. The problem is we've already seen a sequel for San Andreas. It's called Demolition Man. <laughs> San Angeles Police Department. We've seen it, guys. We don't need another San Andreas. Movie. Yeah, I I think I mean look, I I wouldn't be like the first guy in the line to see San Andreas. But yeah. I, you know, I mean, it's the rock. Yeah, it's, it, we're getting Baywatch. We have to pay through Baywatch to get to Rampage. <laughs> okay, and I'm excited. <laughs> All right, Ashley. Our last Twitter question of the day oh, is man. what? Cusco writes: Will there be a Harry Potter anthology movie if the spinoff movie is a hit? Um, yeah, you're you're the the Harry Potter franchise universe. It ain't going anywhere anytime no. soon. That thing Just is gonna money. make bank. You Just don't have to buy it. the Hydrox cookies. You can buy Oreo <laughs> double stuffed vanilla dip chocolate fudge covered because it's gonna crush. This movie is gonna do so well. It's opening at the right time. You're gonna see a lot of Harry Potter flicks from here to whenever. And they're opening the. Uh, is it open yet? The Universal out here. They had a soft opening. Soft opening. Uh, Wendy, Wendy went to that. I know. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, for the Harry Potter thing. Um, <laughs> You know, these amusement parks are killing. I went to the one in Orlando as a, as a single adult male <laughs> by myself. By yourself. And it, and it was incredible. Did, did you have a hat and a wand or your cape? Listen, and I may down. or may not have bought a wand. Yeah, okay. okay, Dennis, I may or may not Tears have bought a wand. Tears forming in your eyes. Whew, that was a good day, Dennis. As long as you didn't get, like, day. arrested and thrown in <laughs> Slytherin, I think you're okay. I'm hammered off Butterbeer. <laughs> yeah. Where are those flavored jelly beans? It does sound like a fun collider, you know, field trip yes. for all yes. of us to go to Harry yes. Potter Land yes. when it opens. So, Dennis, and, I'll put it to you. Are you not only excited for all of us to be at Harry Potter? Land yes. together. We're going to see a lot more from maybe Newt Scatman or maybe somebody else, right? Yeah, I, th I think we're going to see some more, especially if this other one does very well. But it, let's say it doesn't do well. The, then you're going to start hearing rumblings of, oh, they're going to have another Harry Potter, like an actual Harry, like an episode instead of like with Star Wars and anthology movie, like an episode eight, episode nine type of situation. Yeah. Right. It's, it's an interesting situation because whereas Star Wars has those episode eight and nine, and you got to think that wh however they end nine, they'll probably try to continue it even further yeah. with 10, 11, and 12. But if the Star Wars anthology films don't do well, then you also have the episodes to fall back on. Right. Harry Potter, if this one doesn't do well, it's not critically received well, they might just kind of fall by the wayside. Think about it like this. Harry Potter's an aura, right? That's his career after he gets out. He and Ron Weasley turn into like bad boys Harry Potter world. Oh, Michael Bay directs one? What? I hate that idea, <laughs> but I think that there's a lot of good stuff coming in the Harry Potter and, universe. And it's going to be rated R and there's going to be a lot of violence <laughs> and dirty sex jokes. Yeah. And look, if it's taking a cue from bad boys too, Dan Marino can be an aging yeah. wizard. Yeah. Uh, that's all for this episode of Collider Movie Talk. There's so many people for me to thank. I'm not going to mention them all, but I do want to say thanks to the gentleman and the lady here at the table with me first up dennis saying where can the kitties find you uh you can find me on twitter at think here on instagram dennis.tzng and apparently we're going to be at uh the the hogwarts or harry potter world <laughs> yeah. at, at universal studios sometime in the near future we'll be making a teaser trailer for our appearance very soon and one of my best friends of all time i'm so glad he got to be on the show because we both have girlfriends now so this is the only time we get to hang out yeah, is when there's crap. actually a production involved josh where can the kids find you oh mark they can find me in your warm embrace after this show <laughs> Uh, at Josh McCoug on Twitter and Instagram, my uh, YouTube channel, Between the Sheets TV. And uh, you guys can see me here on Collider recapping Arrow tomorrow night. And if you see a guy walking around Universal Studios in Florida with a trench coat and sunglasses, there's a chance it might be the wild man <laughs> himself. Ashley, how about yourself? Where can everybody find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Milva. Happy Tuesday, guys. Ooh, she almost said oh, Monday, everybody. Monday. We hope you guys had a great President's Day weekend. And thanks to everybody here, the crew behind the scenes, Wendy, Jonathan and yes I think Falcor was running around here as well they do such a great job for us each and every day make sure you guys not only bookmarkcollider.com you can go there for all your latest movie
movie news, but subscribe and like this vid right here and go to the YouTube channel, Collider Video. My name is Mark Ellis. This weekend, I'll be the St. Louis Funny Bone telling jokes and probably having some Budweiser's after the show. And last but not least, remember, Star Wars Podcast Awards dot com go there today and nominate jedi council you won't regret it that's all until next time i'm mark ellis hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider